Islamic identity. Maybe a few Druze from the Lebanon have found their way here. But basically, Islam here is brand new. These are huge new territories for us. Also, I would say that we are pessimistic about the, the quality of Muslim piety and the percentages of practicing Muslims in the world. A couple of years ago, the Church of England itself commissioned a report which showed, this was done by a very um, respected sociologist, a certain Peter Brearley, who's a professor at the University of Surrey, and they found that within two years, which means this year, uh, the number of observant Muslims will be greater than the number of observant members of the Church of England in the United Kingdom, which is an extraordinary event, probably the most significant event in English religious history since the Reformation, one of which we're almost oblivious. More and more people are going to the mosques in England, despite the fact that unlike here, we've no longer a uh, principle of, of primary immigration. Nonetheless, somehow, more and more people are turning to religion. We don't know where, we don't know how, we don't know the dynamics of this process at all. But in the community which I visit, I would say that the number of people attending Jumu'ah prayer doubles every seven years. Should be optimistic about that. Other things, other obvious crude things. If you log on to the World Health Organization website, you will see the map that the journalists are always too frightened or ashamed to put in the newspapers, although it's the most um, graphic indication of one of the most fundamental changes in the modern world, which is the rate of HIV infection in different countries of the world. Recently, I think it was three months ago, um, the World Health Organization had a big summit conference about HIV in, in South Africa. South Africa, where AIDS is an absolute catastrophe, and there are communities where 60 or 70 percent of the population is HIV positive, where a significant proportion of children are now being brought up by grandparents because the generation of, in the middle has now completely died off. It's an extraordinary holocaust. But look at their map, and you'll see that there's a kind of gray or completely white space right in the middle of the world, and lo and behold, it's the world of Islam. It's not to say that there aren't people who misbehave in the Muslim world. Visit any nightclub in Bangkok, I'm told, and you'll see no shortage of young Saudis. That happens. Nonetheless, fundamentally, the family structure is intact. In England, 1% of people marry uh, when they're still virgins, which is a negligible percentage. And I should think that represents the 1% of the population that's Muslim, probably. That's the reality of England, it's, it's the reality of the world, that we are not being overcome by this Holocaust. And that should be a source of pride and a source of optimism. The journalists will never mention it, but it's something we, we deserve to, to think about and feel good about. Another area in which I think we ought to improve our self-image, particularly since the media is constantly telling us to have a bad self-image, as if we are somehow the great source of of misery and corruption and backwardness and violence in today's world is absolutely not the case. It's by reflecting on the past hundred years. It's a good time to do so because the millennium has just ended. Their millennium, not ours, but still of, uh, of uh, an interesting symbolic moment. And we find that the great catastrophes of the 20th century, none of them were the work of our people. The West likes to conjure up images of Muslims as hopelessly violent, disorganized, intolerant, bad to minorities, etc., etc. The reality is that only about two or three percent of violent deaths that took place in the 20th century were the work of Muslims. The great majority of the rest were the work of white Christian or post-Christian civilization, despite the fact that it perennially ad nauseam pats itself on the back. They're the ones who um, fought the First and the Second World Wars, engineered Stalin's purges and famines. They created the ideology that led to the Cultural Revolution in China. Um, they are the ones who built Auschwitz. We didn't build Auschwitz. The Jews were entirely safe in the Muslim world during the Holocaust. Another fact that the journalists will never, ever reflect upon. Again, something we need to feel good about. The boot is actually on the other foot. They are the ones who have presided over the most appalling crimes in history. And those ideologies come not as a kind of aberration in their history, but from the very core of their civilization, because Hitler ultimately comes out of, of, of Darwin. And Christianity doesn't get off the hook. Almost all of the German bishops signed the Pact of Allegiance to Hitler. John Cornwell in Cambridge last year published a book called Hitler's Pope that shows how profoundly the Catholic Church was involved in the, uh, 
and the Holocaust. Very painful, but completely undeniable book. These are their crimes. These are not our crimes. And we need to be clear about this when everybody's trying to finger us for what's going wrong in the world. Even today, the great breakdowns in public order, they're not our fault. Bosnia was not our fault. Rwanda was not our fault. The sanctions in Iraq that have killed over a million people, they're not our fault. So I think we need to feel a bit better about ourselves than, than the world would like us to. Now this leads on to another aspect of this attitude that we should have about ourselves in the West. The Westerner wants us to come as suppliants, representatives of defeated, inferior civilizations who come to work as taxi drivers or whatever, incredibly grateful to the white man for all of the blessings that he's conferred upon us for letting us in. That's how they want us to be, because that flatters them. Reality is, as I've just said, their civilization is in many ways profoundly disturbing. But the correct Muslim attitude should never be what they want us to be. Intimidation, humiliation, a kind of um, uh, dhimma, if you like. They want us to be ahl dhimma in this age. Sagirun. Hopeful and fearful. But the Quran, when it refers to those people whom we are required to emulate, namely the awliya, and the awliya simply means those who are as like the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, as possible. What it says about them, more often than any other description that it gives of them, is that la khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. It's a nice bouncy phrase in Arabic that trips off our tongues as we recite it, and we don't think what it means. What it means is as the, the Qur'an and Hadith frequently do, they define spiritual realities in terms of the uh, attitudes of those who have achieved them. Like Ihsan, this is the highest degree of Muslimness as defined in the Hadith of, of Jibreel. You don't get a metaphysical definition. What you get is an explanation of what that person is like in his ibadah worships Allah as if he sees him, and even if he doesn't see him, Allah sees him. That's characteristic of the way the revelation deals with these things, because these, the inner reality of the wali, or the mohsin, can't really be put into words. Some great poets like Mawlan Rumi um, have indicated it in words, but it, 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 but it can never fully be captured, and the point of the revelation is not to be ambiguous. So when, the, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hadith speak about these higher aspects of, of the faith, they always do so in terms of describing the symptoms or the manifestations of that person's state. So the Qur'an here says, لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Now we'd really like to know who these awliya are in their hearts. What is this station? It's, it's sort of exciting after all that boring talk of Islamic economics and Islamic banking to know what's going on in the heart of the perfected human being. That would be nice, but... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't tell us. But we can work it out uh, very indirectly and tentatively because of course only those who are there know what it is. Only those who have tasted honey uh, have the right to talk about honey. We can just listen to their uh, descriptions and smack our lips, hopefully. But wali is the word it's one of those names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that can be applied to human beings. In other words, it's one of those divine names which are bridges with humanity and which indicate our theomorphic nature.